The film opens with a man named John Oldman loading his belongings into a pickup truck because he is leaving his home forever. But then four of his university colleagues surprised him by throwing a farewell party. They wonder why John was going to leave without even saying goodbye. John said that he doesn't like saying goodbye. The group consists of biologist Harry, Christian literature expert Edith, anthropologist Dan, and historian Sandy. John invites his colleagues to his home, where they ask why he suddenly wants to leave after working for 10 years. John replies that he cannot stay in one place for long. He's done this before. But his friends do not believe that he would have done this because he is only 35 years old. Edith says that her age has not increased at all in 10 years, and every woman would do anything to know this secret. Meanwhile, archaeology professor Art Jenkins and his student girlfriend Linda also attend the farewell party. Like the others, they also asked why John wanted to go. John says he likes to move forward with the times, but his colleagues are not convinced by this answer. Still, they wish him all the best for his next destination. Meanwhile, Dan finds a carved stone that was at least 12,000 to 17,000 years old. It is a chisel and was used by the Cro-Magnons in the Paleolithic period. Everyone is surprised by this discovery, while John is a little worried. Colleagues say he's creating mystery here. If he has something to say, he can say it. John says he wants to tell them something, but he's never done it before. So he wonders how it'll pan out. He asks, what if a man from the Upper Paleolithic survived until the present day? Dan replies that if he lived for 140 centuries, he would change with each century. He would be curious, and he would have a wealth of knowledge. But it is not possible to survive for 14,000 years. Biologist Harry says that the human body is designed to live a maximum of 190 years, but most people die due to slow poisoning. However, if a person completely regenerates his body cells, he can live for thousands of years. Because all the cells in the pancreas are replaced in 24 hours, the lining of the stomach is replaced in three days, and the entire body changes every seven years. It is possible if the body does the right detox and renewal. He further says that many things are possible. There was a time when people believed in magic, and now in science. Harry gives the example of Christopher Columbus, saying that he set off to find a new route to India, but everyone thought he was crazy. Meanwhile, John surprised everyone by claiming that he was on the ship with Christopher Columbus at that time. He was already convinced that the earth was round, but at that point, he still thought he might fall off an edge someplace. After hearing this, no one believed his words. However, like a science fiction movie, they still wanted to hear his story. Harry tells John that it means you're Cro-Magnon, and he makes a strange noise in response, causing everyone to laugh. Sandy, who went to get something to eat, returns and asks what happened. Professor Art explains that John is claiming he is 14,000 years old. Sandy tells John to stop joking because he doesn't look older than 900 days. He further reveals that he moves every 10 years when people start noticing that he is not aging. When he was born thousands of years ago, his age stopped increasing after 35 years. He used to lead the group, but after a time, he was driven away because they felt that John was stealing their age. He explains that he has always been followed because he will not die. In this way, he joined the new tribes he met along the way and moved forward from time to time. He says that the first 2,000 years were very cold, but the weather was warm at lower altitudes. Over time, the glaciers started melting and seas started appearing. The continents began to drift apart due to the rising sea levels. Professor Art interrupted him at that moment and said that we have read all this in books, to which John replied that through books he is able to recall his memories. Otherwise, it is impossible to remember everything for 14,000 years. Finally, the conversation turns to the topic of religion and Linda asks if in those 14,000 years, he has ever been curious about where he came from. John says that they always looked up to the sky and thought that there were big people up there, and it was all under their control. Initially, he thought that maybe he was not dying because he was a bad person, but then he thought that maybe he was cursed or blessed with immortality. John's colleagues wonder why he is telling them his truth, and John says he wants to say goodbye to them as John, not as a stranger. Saying this, he starts loading the remaining items into the truck, while his friends think that he has a serious problem. However, they still have many questions, and they ask John to tell them about historical times. John explains that he started walking east because he thought it would be warmer there. It was around the beginning of the Bronze Age, so he followed the trade route from the east. As he progressed, he learned new languages. During this period, myths and new gods emerged everywhere. So many and so different. Finally, he realized that it was probably all hogwash. He said he was Sumerian for 2,000 years, 
eventually becoming Babylonian during the reign of Hammurabi, and even spent some time sailing as a Phoenician. He explains that it was easy to get ahead as a hunter-gatherer, but difficult when villages emerged, tougher still in city-states where authority was centralized and strangers were suspected, making it difficult to hide identity. He learned a few tricks, and even faked his own death a couple of times. Despite all this, he continued eastward and came to India, where he met the Buddha. John says that he was a most extraordinary man and that he had never seen a man like the Buddha before, so he became his disciple and remained with him until his death. He taught John many things that he had never thought about before. They knew there was something different about Joan, but John never told them the truth. Professor Art interrupts him and asks what would happen if he told everyone John's secret, to which John calmly replies that no one will believe him and they will call him crazy. Meanwhile, Professor Art secretly invites psychiatrist Dr. Will Gruber, because he thinks there is a problem with John. Dr. Will expressed regret that, had he been here from the beginning, he would have been able to understand John's story better when he was told that, according to John, he has been alive for the last 14,000 years. They ask John if he has ever been seriously ill in 14,000 years. John says that over the past hundreds of years, he has suffered from yellow fever, typhoid, smallpox, and the Black Plague. Will doesn't understand why he doesn't have any scars on his body if he had smallpox. However, John says that scars never form on his body. When asked about his studies, John confessed that he has 10 degrees, having obtained a biology degree at Oxford in 1840. But knowledge at that time was limited. Hearing this, Will says that, according to Professor Art, 14,000 years ago, your companions had expelled you from the clan because they thought that you were stealing their age. Maybe this is true. Maybe you are a vampire. Saying this, Will points his revolver at John and says that he wants to see whether John dies or not. John reminds him that he never claimed immortality. He might die. Eventually Will gives up and leaves. Harry informs them that his wife recently died of cancer, so he becomes offensive. John quickly goes out to stop Will, offering comfort and gently requesting the revolver, only to discover that the gun contains no bullets. John returns, and Dan asks if there might be other people like John, who might have survived old age. John admits that in the 16th century, he met a man who looked just like him, so he told him about his situation. They had a fleeting two-day friendship, in which they told each other about their past. The two had solid arguments, but since they did not trust each other at all, they parted ways. 200 years later, John saw him at a train station in Brussels, although he was lost in the crowd. Eventually, the discussion turns to religion, and Dan asks if he is religious. John revealed that he does not follow any known religion, nor does he feel the need to believe in God anymore. He does not deny that he does not exist, but he believes that if God exists, then he may be all around us. Continuing this theme, Dan asks him if he has ever met someone from their religious history, a person from the Bible. John answers yes, however, he doesn't want to talk about the topic because it's going in a direction he didn't expect. When the group insisted, he explained that the Bible was a myth based on certain historical events. After hearing this, Edith, who believes strongly in the Bible, becomes angry and wants to leave. However, she reluctantly stops after being persuaded by her friends. Continuing the story, John says that he liked what the Buddha taught and pondered it for 500 years. Then, he became an Etruscan and seeped into the Roman Empire. But he faced real chaos with wars and massacres, so he moved to the Near East. He thought, why not present the Buddha's teachings in a modern form? So, he tried to rebel against Rome, and the result, was that the Roman Empire destroyed him. Edith is shocked to hear this and says that she knew John would claim to be Jesus Christ, but John points out that this legend was born out of his death. When he was crucified, he blocked the pain and slowed down all the processes in his body, as he had learned in Tibet and India. So, they thought that he was dead. So his followers pulled him from the cross and placed him in a cave. After some time, his body returned to normal, as he had been trained. He attempted to move away without attracting attention, although his followers thought he had been resurrected. By the time John ascended into Central Europe, the popular legend that Jesus Christ had come to life had spread. After hearing this, everyone's emotions reached their peak. Art wants John to show them the marks of the crucifixion, but John reminds him that his body never gets scars. He reveals that Christianity shares many similarities with pagan beliefs. These words hurt Edith, so Dan tells her that early Christian leaders threw away Hebrew manuscripts and borrowed from pagan sources all over the place. He also pointed out that the teachings of Buddha and Jesus Christ reflect similar values, compassion, tolerance, 
brotherhood, and love. John says that this is what he was trying to teach in the past, but many priests took advantage of this, and created concepts like heaven and hell to keep the people under control through fear. Meanwhile, Will returns, very embarrassed. Will asks John where the name Jesus first came from. John says he always called himself John. However, when rumors of a resurrection began to spread, the name became confused with the Hebrew meaning, and he began to be called Joseph, meaning God is merciful. He explained that his stay on earth was seen as divine proof of immortality, leading him to be known as Yeshua, meaning God is salvation. Over time, that name became Jesus via ancient Greek and medieval Latin. Edith angrily says that he was never Jesus. John admitted that he never turned water into wine or raised the dead. He has cured a few people only with Eastern medicine. Moreover, he never even said that God was his father. However, Edith still maintains that he was never Jesus. John says that one day, while preaching on a mountain, he asked the people what they thought about him and who they thought I was. He gave the people a choice, whether to believe or not. This is the option that John is now giving to his colleagues. Hearing this, Edith starts crying. Will says things have gone too far, and for everyone's sake, John should admit the truth. After a few seconds of consideration, John apologizes to everyone and explains that it was just a make-believe story, causing everyone except Sandy to become disappointed and start leaving one by one. But Sandy stays because she loves John one-sidedly, and suspects that he is not lying. She asks John how many times he has changed his name, and John says he has only changed his surname. Unaware that Will is standing behind him, he explains that he adopted the name John Thomas Party Will when he taught at Harvard nearly 60 years ago. Will is stunned to hear this. Although he still doesn't believe it, John admits that Will's mother's name was Nola, and that their dog was named Woofy. Will starts crying like a baby and asks why he left him and his mother in the past. John says I move on with time, and that's what I did. Will has an emotional breakdown, then has a heart attack, and dies. This was the first time John experienced his son's death in 14,000 years, after which he went inside the truck. He is about to leave for a new destination, but after going a few meters, he stops to invite Sandy, who loves him despite knowing that one day, he will leave her.